When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. Um, we're going to talk this morning about the Reformation. If you don't know what that is, hopefully by the end of the service, you will. Because this Wednesday is the anniversary of a very important date in history. This Wednesday, you know what it is? It's October 31st, right? It's Halloween? No, it's, it's, it is October 31st. But in October 31st, 1517, is recognized as the date as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. This was the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the castle church door in Wittenberg. On our website, in the About Us section, that gives some distinctives of Berean Bible Church, it says this, First of all, we are reformed in the way that we view the world and the Bible. This means that we consider ourselves to have historically descended from those churches of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. It goes on to say, we believe in the absolute sovereignty of the Almighty God. This is one of the principles of the Reformation. This is one of the things that was developed during that time, that God is absolutely sovereign. Sola fide, which means salvation by grace through faith alone, and sola scriptura, the scripture alone. So we at Berean Bible Church, we think the Reformation was pretty important. Now, how you view the Reformation will depend on your theological persuasion. Roman Catholic historians interpret the Reformation as a heresy that was inspired by Martin Luther. While Protestant historians, such as Schaff and Grimm, interpret the Reformation largely as a religious movement that sought to recover the purity of the primitive Christianity that's depicted in the New Testament. That's all the Reformation was, trying to get back to the New Testament teaching. They sought to develop, the Reformers did, a theology that was in complete accord with the New Testament and believed this could never be a reality as long as the church, instead of the Bible, was made the final authority. And that's what was happening during that period. The church was the authority. It wasn't the Scripture. The Reformation was to get the Scripture back in authority. The Reformation proper, as I said, began October 31st, 1517, when a monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the castle church door in Wittenberg. Martin Luther was probably one of the most influential figures in Western history. His writings were responsible for fractionalizing the Catholic Church and sparking the Protestant Reformation. His central teaching that the Bible is the central source of religious authority and that salvation is reached through faith and not deeds shaped the core of Protestantism. Now, it's sad to say that church history is a subject that I think few first century Americans really know that much about. We don't know much about our past as a church, and that's kind of sad, I think. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Fortunately, we are not the first people who have been engaged in this battle, referring to the Christian life. And there is nothing which can be of greater help to us next to the Scriptures than the history of the church. And I agree, and I think it even goes beyond that, the history of Israel. You know, as we see what Israel went through, it seems like we kind of repeat those cycles. So I want us this morning to look at the history of Martin Luther and the Reformation and see what we can learn from that. Oh, wrong Martin Luther. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to clarify, when I say Martin Luther, this is not who I'm talking about. All right? This is Martin Luther King Jr., and I've been in this, there's this before, I'm talking about Martin Luther, and they, what does he got to do? Not him, this guy, okay? You recognize him? You probably died before he was born, most of you anyway. Martin Luther was born November 10th, 1483, in Germany. He attended school in Mansfield, at Magneburg, under the Brethren of Common Life, and at Eilsenben. Uh, he then went to the University at Erfurt in 1501 where he came under the anomalous influence. He learned Greek. He graduated B.A. in 1502 and M.A. in 1505. His father wanted him to study law. And that's probably the direction he was headed. But in 1505, Luther became 
very frightened during a severe thunderstorm on the road to Stottenberg, or Stott, Stotternham, and promised St. Anne, I'm not sure who she is, but he promised her that he would become a monk if he was spared. Well, about two weeks later, he entered a monastery. He, kept, he lived through it. He kept his promise, so we know he's a man of his word. He entered a monastery of the Augustinian order at Erfurt. Here in 1507, he was ordained and celebrated his first mass. In 1511, Luther was transferred to Wittenberg, and during the next year, he became professor of Bible and received his Doctor of Theology degree. Understand, he's not a Christian yet. He's teaching the Bible. He's got a doctor in theology. He doesn't know the Lord. Well, in his lectures from 1513 to 1515, he expounded the Psalms. And around 1515, he finished the Psalms and began to start the book, he began to teach through the book of Romans. It was in 1515 that Luther had what he called the Tower Experience. He said that Romans 117 just jumped out of the scripture and brought him to God. This was his key verse. For in, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. He read this verse and it convicted him that only faith in Christ could make one just before God. From that time on, sola fide, justification by faith alone, and sola scriptura, the idea that the scripture is only, only authority for sinful man in seeking salvation, became the main points in his theological system. He came to realize that God's righteousness in Romans 1 is not the justice that we have to fear, but the positive righteousness that God gives believers in Christ. It is a righteousness they receive by personally trusting in the Lord Yeshua. He began to understand that the Roman Catholic Church did not square with the Scriptures. Now, here he is. He's in the midst of this church. He's a monk in the Catholic Church, but he's having problems. I don't agree with what they're saying. Ever felt that in the church? <laughs> As he hears confessions at Wittenberg, he hears that the people are trusting their works and they're trusting in their indulgence letters, not in Christ. Now, Archbishop Albert of Brandenburg, through a series of circumstances, wound up in some high offices in the church. Now, technically, he was not eligible for those offices because of his age. Also, church law forbade multiple occupation of high ecclesiastical offices by one person, but the Pope agreed to overlook these legal problems if Albert would pay him a huge sum of money. How sick is that? Politics in the church. Corruption. So Albert borrowed the money from the wealthy, powerful Fugger Bank, House of Osberg. Then to enable Albert to raise money to pay his debts and to raise money to build a new St. Peter's Church in Rome, Pope Leo X authorized an indulgence which Albert was permitted to have preached and sold in his diocese. Now, let me explain to you what's going on here. An indulgence is an official church provision by which a penitent sinner could purchase from the Pope a remission of the punishment for temporal sins. Sins that would otherwise have to be atoned for in purgatory. Indulgence benefits were even extended to departed souls supposedly already in purgatory. Listen, this was an ingenious money-raising, fun-raising. This, this was, he should have been a Baptist. This was better than any Baptist ever came up with. All right, here's the idea. We got these letters of indulgence. If you pay so much money, the Pope will give you this letter forgiving some of your sins. See, at that time, they believed anybody died went to purgatory. And so, if you bought this letter of indulgence, you shorten your time. Purgatory was a time of suffering. Because the Catholic Church taught that, in a certain sense, Yeshua's merit covered some of your sins. But there was a penalty that you still had to pay. And God punished you either in this life or in purgatory. So the indulgence was a means to get rid of that penalty. In Roman Catholicism, purgatory is the place of cleansing after death. And so not only you, but say your relative died. You know, your mother dies or your husband or someone. And they say, well, they're in purgatory now, but the more you pay, the shorter their time will be in purgatory. You can get them out, get them out of that suffering, get them into heaven. Who didn't want to do that? The problem was you never knew when to stop. You didn't know when they got out of purgatory. You just keep giving. 
That's how the Catholic Church became the wealthiest organization in the world. According to this doctrine, Christians go to purgatory to be purified of venial sins that were unconfessed and unforgiven on earth. After the appropriate cleansing had taken place, the soul is ready to be received into heaven. So you get all this stuff burned up, you get all the punishment out of the way, and you get to go to heaven. So you see, Yeshua really didn't cover all your sins, just the majority of them. So indulgences, masses, and prayers for the dead can speed up the cleansing process and reduce this time you've got to do in purgatory. Now let me just say here that purgatory is not a biblical doctrine. I think that you are aware of that, but it is an invention of man. And it really served its purpose. All right, so Albert had been given permission to do these indulgences, so he commissioned a Dominican monk by the name of John Tetzel as an indulgence preacher. And Tetzel was going around preaching and selling indulgences throughout Germany. He was preaching that, you know, you're in purgatory, we can shorten that time, and that was his message. His crassly mercenary sermons were successful and filling the church coffers. I mean, people were paying like crazy. You know, I mean, who wants to suffer? Who wants to go to purgatory and go through all this pain? And Tetzel's slogan that was famous was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, know the rest of it? The soul into heaven springs. Quite catchy, right? You give your money, you get to go to heaven. All right? 50% of the money he raised was used to build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Tetzel, Tetzel preached that buying indulgences, you could buy a relative out of purgatory, get them into heaven. Now, you might be thinking, what is wrong with these people? I mean, how could anyone believe such nonsense as that about purgatory and about buying your way out of purgatory? How, how could the people be so foolish? Well, let me remind you something, or maybe let me teach you something that you don't know. Prior to the Reformation, the scriptures were not translated into the people's language. They didn't have Bible. When you went to church for Mass, the whole thing was in Latin. So you didn't get a lot of teaching at church either. All right? There was no Bible to speak of in the hands of the people. The only contact that people had with the Bible was read by the priests at church, and it was in Latin. So really, they had nothing. Consequently, nobody understood it. Nobody read it except the priest who would expound upon this Latin text. The people would simply believe whatever the priest said because they had no basis to evaluate what they said. I mean, they're the church. They're an authority. They're saying this. It must be right. They have the Bible. We don't have it. We just have to believe them. They couldn't read Latin, let alone interpret it. So they accepted what was told them. They just bought it. Thank God for men like Martin Luther who could understand and said, wait a second, this is wrong. Century after century went by in this way within the Roman Catholic Church. They developed a system that was never really investigated by the people, mainly because they didn't have a Bible in their own language. They really couldn't do that. The people had unquestioningly accepted the priests' interpretations and conformity to the system of Rome. What the Reformation did more than anything else was to give the Bible to the people. It put the Word of God in the people's hands. And when they began to read the scriptures, they began to see the false teaching and the misrepresentations of the gospel that had been given to them for centuries. It was the truth of the gospel that helped shatter the dark ages. And Protestant Christianity, as we know it today, was born out of that. And today we have the Bible in our own language and are therefore able to evaluate the validity of any religious system by the Bible standard. Because we have it, we can read it, we can understand it. They didn't have that. When Luther discovered what was going on as far as Tetzel going around preaching these indulgences, remember Luther had just come to Christ. He had just realized the truth of the gospel. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Sola fide, he understood that. Well, when he found out what Tetzel was doing, he drafted his famous 95 Thesis. You know, you've all heard about that. And again, October 31st, 1517, was he took that and he nailed it to the castle church door in Wittenberg. In these 95 theses, he condemned the abuses of the indulgence system and challenged all comers to debate on the matter. So this, you know, we think of the 95 theses, people might think, well, this is, you know, him putting up the, you know, the scriptural truth. No, he's challenging 
this whole idea of indulgences in this. This is how this thing started. So he posts them up there, each one challenging. Let me give you a couple of Number 27 of the 95 says this. Those who assert that a soul straightway flies out of purgatory as a coin tinkles in the collection box are preaching an invention of man. See, now the people are reading this, they're going, what? We don't have to do that? And you can imagine how people are happy they are not to have to be separated from their money, right? And so they're on board with this stuff. This, is, this sounds great. Number 32 said, those who think themselves sure of salvation through their letters of pardon will be damned forever with their teachers. So he's stirring some stuff up here, okay? In 14 days, listen, this was before email, before Twitter, Facebook, any of that stuff. In 14 days, Martin Luther's thesis had spread all over Germany. That's how important this was. It just caught a fire. And people were like, what? We don't have to be doing this stuff? And now you have to understand, too, just 100 years earlier, Huss had been burned at the stake for saying things not too different than what Luther was saying. So he's putting his life on the line here. When his 95 Thesis was translated and widely circulated, they brought an explosion of anti-church feelings that wrecked the indulgence. Now that's not good news for the Catholic Church, okay? You're hitting them in the pocket. Given practical application in this way, Luther's theology could no longer go unnoticed. And he came at once under ecclesiastical pressures ranging from attempts at intimidation to promise you know, uh, subsidies, so if you were, if he would just go along with them, shut your mouth, we'll kick, give you a little kickback here along with it, all right? Well, early in 1521, a bull of excommunication was prepared that if carried out would have deprived Luther of civil rights and protection. They could literally put this man to death. Well, before its execution, not his execution, but the bull's execution, Charles V agreed to give Luther the chance to recant at the Diet of Worms. Here, Luther was made his resounding confession before the emperor, princes, and rulers. So they brought him in and said, listen, you've got you to renounce all this stuff. And here's what Luther said. I asked for the scriptures, and Eck offers me the fathers. I asked for the son, and he shows me his lanterns. I asked, where is your scriptural proof? And he adduces Ambrose and Cyril. With all due respect to the fathers, I prefer the authority of the scriptures. Amen. Praise God for Luther taking a stand on the Word of God. This same quote can be used today by preterists as they stand against those who want to shove the creeds down their throat or shove tradition and history down. This is not how we used to do it. I prefer the authority of the Scripture. Charles V said to Luther, one friar who goes, against, goes counter to all Christianity for a thousand years must be wrong. Must be wrong? No, he is going against a thousand years of history. But he was going with the Scriptures. And see, we have an infallible word that we have to stick to. No matter what the culture, no matter what the society is, we've got to stick with the Scriptures. I've had this same thing said to me about preterism when I first became a preterist. Oh, you're telling me that you're so proud that you see something that people for 1,600 years haven't seen? I'm like, and so I had, my response to that was always the same. You ever heard of the Reformation? A thousand years. And listen, this is, has to do with salvation. Okay, we're just still talking about eschatology here, which I think is important, but Luther's dealing with how a man comes to Christ. Well, Luther's reply to this was this. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. Do what you want with me. i got to stick with the Scriptures. So Luther went against the corrupt Christianity of the day, but he stuck to the Scripture. Sola fide, sola scriptura. Those are the cries of the Reformation. And that's why we as a church see ourselves as descended from this tradition, because that's still our cry. Sola fide, sola scriptura. Now, Luther said that, the, that only Erasmus knew the real issue of the Reformation. And he said that issue was the bondage of the will. Now, Erasmus was Europe's most famous philosopher in that day. He and Luther debated on the question of whether or not the human creature has the freedom to accept or refuse divine grace. The issue was, do we have a free will? That issue is still hotly debated today. This debate was not new. 
In the 5th century, Augustine and Pelagius debated the same issue. And Pelagius' views were condemned by the church council of Ephesus in 431. Erasmus published a diatribe on free will in 1524. And to this, Luther responded with a sharp and almost scornful reply in his book, The Bondage of the Will, in 1525. So within a year, he got out The Bondage of the Will. Have you ever seen the book? It's about this thick, okay? All about the bondage of the human will. It was a powerful statement of the Augustinian position that in matters of right conduct and salvation, the will has no power to act apart from the divine initiative. Now Luther taught that man, because of the fall, was so bound by sin that he could not of himself do anything to avail himself to get out of that situation, but that God had to do it. This is what's called the doctrine of total depravity. Luther believed that man has the power of choice. Please understand that. that's an important distinction. Because people today think when you say people don't have free will, we don't make choices. Man has the power of choice, but that the will of man was not free. Luther and Erasmus disagreed. Erasmus taught that the will of man was always able to choose good or evil. Luther accused Erasmus of Epicureanism, the idea that the universe is basically chance. It teaches that God hasn't foreordained everything. Luther said that Erasmus taught an indeterminate God, a God that hasn't determined anything. He said that was semi-Pelagianism. Luther said, this is not only a heresy, it is blasphemy. And more than blasphemy, he said it was atheism. Very important point here, people. He's saying what Ara this teaching of Erasmus on the free will was atheism, and this is why. He says, if God is not totally in control of everything, He's not God. He said that Erasmus' God didn't exist and that he was therefore teaching a form of atheism. You get his argument? Great argument. If God's not in control of everything, he is not God. Something else is controlling certain things, not him. Beautiful argument. Well, Luther believed that after the fall, man's will was a selfish, sinful will. He said man could choose. He was uncoerced. But fallen man had no desire for anything except evil. And as long as he is inclined only to evil, he chooses only evil. Jonathan Edwards, in his essay, The Freedom of the Will, wrote that all men everywhere always act according to the strongest inclination at any given time. Now, after the fall, the Bible teaches that man's strongest inclination at any given moment is always sin. Because fallen man loves darkness and he hates light. So whatever he is confronted with a choice between darkness and light, he chooses darkness. He chooses what is attractive to him. Look at John 3, 19 through 20. He says, this is judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. See, a person always chooses according to his strongest inclination. He is in bondage, listen, to choose what he loves. Now you might ask, well, where's the bondage in choosing what you love? Well, the bondage comes in the result of the choice. See, the consequence, he doesn't like. He wants to live forever. He wants joy, he wants love, he wants peace, but he hates righteousness. Look at me at Zechariah 1, which is a call to Israel to return to the Lord. It says, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Bechariah, the son of Idu, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts. goes on to say that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, of whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Now, commenting on these verses, Luther said, It is not in your power to turn to God. He says, If you think that it's in your power to turn to God, you have missed the whole point of the Reformation and don't understand total depravity. 
It is not in your power to turn to God. You are a sinner. You are dead. You're eaten up with corruption. Every choice of yours is evil, not good. So how can we turn to him who is light, righteousness, holy, and good? Now this is important here. Luther taught that you have a duty to return to God, but you do not have the ability. And Luther taught responsibility does not imply ability. Look at John 12, 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Yeshua spoke, and He went away and hid Himself from them. So Yeshua says, believe in the light. And most believers today would say, because Christ commands us to believe, we must be able to believe. But that's not correct. And if you just follow the context, let's go down. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Their unbelief was fulfilling prophecy. Which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report to whom of the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, look what it says, they could not believe. Because Isaiah says, and he goes on to say, he's blinded their minds. They couldn't believe. And that's why they didn't believe, is because they couldn't believe. Now notice what Yeshua said earlier in John's Gospel. In 10.26 he says, But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Why didn't they believe? Because they didn't belong to him. They were somebody else's sheep. They had not been given to him by the Father. So they could not believe. See, Scripture states dogmatically some things that a lost man cannot do. Man cannot perceive the kingdom of God until he's born again. John 3, 3. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see. And that idea there is perceive, understand. He can't understand. He can't grasp the kingdom of God. He first has to be given spiritual life. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, But a natural man, that's sukakos. And it's the man, it means man without the Spirit. Does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He can't understand them. Why? Because they're spiritually appraised. See, the natural man without the Spirit can't make any sense of the things of God until he has first been effectually called by the Holy Spirit. This is a verse, if you don't know, you need to mark it, you need to memorize it, you need to learn it. John 6.44 says, No one, no one can come to me, Yeshua is saying, unless, there's an exception to this no one, unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So people can come to me if they are drawn by the Father. Now, our Arminian brother have taken this word draw and say, well, this, what this means here is call or invite. No one comes unless they're invited. No one comes unless they're called. Well, the Greek word translated here draws helkuo. And helkuo means to drag by irresistible superiority. It is used eight times in the New Testament. So to understand what it means, let's just look at a few of them. All right? Helkuo. You don't come unless you're drawn. John 18.10. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. Helkuo and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. Now, would call or invite fit here? Did Peter invite his sword to come out? Did Peter call his sword? You know, like, just put his hand up there. Come on, sword. No, we hadn't got to the Lord of the Rings stuff yet, okay? So that didn't work that way. He grabbed the sword and he pulled it out. Sword had no will of its own, okay? It couldn't resist him. Helkuo, same word. Acts 16, 19. But when the masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, the seizing them. They grabbed them by the throat and they dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities. Again, dragged here is Helkuo. It means call or invite, right? Not at all. They didn't say, Paul, would you pull? we'd like to invite you to come to the marketplace to, before the authorities. They grabbed them, they throttled them. It, again, this has to do with profit, people. When you mess with people's money, they get really upset. They drag them before the authorities. We drag to be dragged with irresistible superiority. James 2, 6, But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you to court again? Helkuo. The usage of this word makes it clear that helkuo means to drag by irresistible superiority. 
Let me ask you to do this. Take the time to look up all eight verses that Helkua is used in, in the New Testament. They all have the idea of dragging, not inviting, not calling. All right, I'll give you one more. John 21, 11. Simon Peter went up and drew Helkuo the net to the land full of large fish, 153. So what's Peter doing? This big net full of fish, I'd like to invite you to come to the shore. I'd like to call you, would you please come to the shore? No, can you, this dragging, I mean, he's pulling this net full of fish. There's a lot of effort involved here. All right, there I gave you five of the eight. Please do me a favor, look up the other three. Check this out for yourself. Be Bereans and look them up. Listen, I have seen many Arminians fall on this verse, John 6, 44. If they're honest, they read it, you show them the different uses of that word draw, it's like, wow, there's, there's no out to this that I have seen. And like I said, I've seen a lot of Arminians give up and become Calvinists because they realize what this is teaching. So look it up. Look at the different uses. All of them give you the same sense. And remember, usage always takes precedence over etymology, but the etymology is to drag by irresistible superiority, and the usage is that same way, so guess what? We're stuck. That's how it works. No one comes unless God draws. This is what Calvin taught. It's called irresistible grace or sovereign grace. It's not that God drags those who don't want to come. I think people hear about Calvinism and they think, oh, God drags people and they don't want to even come. And they, No. The idea is that God makes you willing by His grace in regeneration. God gives a spiritual life which includes a desire for Him. When He puts a new heart within us, there's a desire to know Him. And if we have that desire, we're going to act accordingly and we're going to choose Christ because our will is inclined that way. Now, we have to understand that a sinner absolutely cannot, it's not will not, but cannot come to Christ unless God first does something in that sinner. And that something is what the Bible calls regeneration or the new birth. It is the exclusive work of God, the Holy Spirit. Man has no part whatsoever in regeneration. In John 11, Yeshua commands Lazarus to come forth out of the grave. Does that imply that Lazarus had the ability to come out of the grave? Look at John 11:43. When he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He mentioned his name because if he had just said come forth, everybody dead would have been coming out. All right? I wanted Lazarus. So Lazarus came out. Now, he didn't have the ability to obey this command. He was dead. An unsaved man, natural man, has a duty to believe the gospel, but he does not have the ability and since the Reformation, people have departed from the sovereignty of grace. Most professing Christians are not. But of those who really are Christians, most have departed from the Reformation in this way. All of the Reformers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Cramner, the German Reformer, the Swiss Reformer, the French Reformer, the Scottish Reformer, the English Reformer, Every one of them believed not only in grace, but in sovereign grace. And this movement is taking place on these different places. They're all coming to the same persuasion, the same conviction at the same time because the Reformation was a work of God. We brought life to a dead church. The majority of believers today try to have the grace without the sovereignty of grace. Evangelical Christianity is trying to hold on to grace provided while rejecting grace applied. Grace proves irresistible just because it destroys the disposition to resist. Now, why does God command us to do what we cannot do? Augustine answered that question by saying to show us how depraved we are. God tells us to do something. We can't do it. The foundation of Reformed theology is the doctrine of total depravity. Many people think they have trouble with the, the doctrines of election and predestination, but the real problem is they don't understand how depraved we really are. When God commands us to return and promises that if we do return, He will return to us, we won't do it, we can't do it, because we're in bondage what we love, which is darkness and evil. We reject the light, we reject the goodness. We should be able to turn to God, but we're not, because our choice. we made a choice in the garden to disobey God. 
We all chose an Adam to turn away. We saw this in Romans 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death, spiritual death, through that sin, and so death spread to all men. Spiritual death spread to everybody. Why? Because all sinned. Past tense. All sinned in Adam. Federal headship. We all made a choice in the garden to turn away from God. And this act has left us spiritually dead. And, and let me just say a word here to those preterists that believe that, you know, this is true up until 8070. At 8070, it all changes. No more election anymore. My question is, why did God used to have to draw them into himself, but now he doesn't? What changed after AD 70? Is man no longer spiritually dead? Is he no longer born in that And if he's not born in that condition, what condition is he born in? Is he born in some neutral condition, or is he born spiritually alive? What changed? Are men no longer born in sin separated from God? And if they are, they don't need a Savior. And if everyone now is born alive, then guess what? We don't need a Savior anyway. It's universal redemption. Everybody is saved because we don't need that Savior. We're all born alive. We're born in a relationship with God. But if men are still born dead, guess what? The only way they're going to ever get to God is if He calls them to Himself. What has changed? And, and can you show me from the Scriptures, where it states or even implies that apart from Christ, men are no longer dead after 87. You know, we have all kinds of extremes of cessationism after 87. Now, we know if you're going to be accurate with the Bible, some things definitely change. Some things are different. All right, we're in a different time. We have to realize that. We have to recognize it. The problem is, because we recognize that, then some people say, well, some people go to the street. Everything changed. And there's preterists out there that teach there's no eternal life anymore. See, it's all, that all happened prior to 8070. It's all done. God's done. It's amazing to me. There's someone who teaches this. They go to church every Sunday. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's all over. It's all done. It's all gone. And yet you're acting, going, what are you doing? It doesn't make any sense to me. And there's every form of extreme in between there, okay? of what it ended and what didn't. And I think we have to be careful. And we have to be discerning. We have to try to figure out and have some kind of scriptural evidence as to say why something did or did not end then. But the very fact that God commands us to do that which we are utterly unable, morally unable to do, shows just how depraved we are. And if salvation is not going to come at all, it's going to have to be applied sovereignly. And see, this, let me tell you why this is so important, because this overthrows self-confidence. It convinces sinners that their salvation is altogether out of their hands. It shuts them up to a self-despairing dependency on the glorious grace of the sovereign God. It humbles men before a sovereign God. Let's talk for a moment about the nature of the human will. Like I said, this is a big debate today, this idea of, you know, does man have a free will? Free will is really... Contradiction in terms. The only way a will could ever be free is that no influence whatsoever. None. Totally uninfluenced. The will is the faculty of choice. The will is the immediate cause of all action. You think about something, and then you do it. And in every act of the will, there's a preference. There's a desire for one thing rather than another thing. To will is to choose, and to choose is to decide between two or more alternatives. But there's something which influences that choice. The will is not causative. Because something causes it to choose, therefore that something must be the causative agent. Now what is it? What is it that determines the will? If it's not causative, then what is it that causes you to make a choice? Let's say that your boss comes to you and says, you're going to California. You don't have a choice if you want to keep your job. Now, for those of you who are watching from California, we're not talking to you, you're already there, okay? But for East Coasters, all right? But your boss does give you a choice. He says, would you like to drive or fly? So what determines which one of those options you choose? What's going to determine your choice is the strongest motive power which is brought to bear upon it? With one, it may be logic of reason. You know, if I drive, it's going to take me, you know, three to five days. That's just too much time in a car. I don't want to do that. If I fly, it's going to take me, you know, 
four hours maybe, I'll choose to fly. With another, maybe the impulse of emotion, I'm kind of scared of flying. I don't like to get in a plane, so I think I'd just rather drive. What you think causes you to will. Whichever of these pre present the strongest motive power and exerts the greatest influence upon us is that which impels us to act. In other words, the action of the will is determined by the mind, or in Hebrew, the heart. The will is not free, as Luther taught. It is in bondage to the heart. The Word of God teaches that the heart is that which is the dominating center of our being. Look at Proverbs 4.23. Watch over your heart with all diligence. The heart here is thinking. For from it flow the springs of life. I like the way the complete Jewish Bible puts this. Above everything else, guard your heart. Why? For it is the source of life's consequences. Yeah, it sure is, because the decisions you make, you suffer the consequences. Our choices are determined by our desires. And when we have conflicting desires, whichever desire is greater at the time of the decision is the one we'll choose. For example, which ca what causes a person to overeat? It's your, well, it's, you're right. They like to eat, so it's your mind, your thinking. That's going to determine your choice. If you desire at the moment, if your desire, your strongest desire is self-gratification, then what are you going to do? Overeat. Overeat. But if your desire is to maintain a healthy weight for the purpose of keeping yourself healthy, what are you going to do? You're going to say, mm, I'm not going to do that. It's what's the strongest desire and how you think. If you think something is bad, you're not going to do it. If you don't like something, you're not going to do it. You're not going to choose what you hate. You're with a group of people and they say, let's go get Chinese. Well, you hate Chinese. What are you going to do? Say, oh, all right, I'll choose Chinese. No, you hate it. You say, you get that, I'll get next door's Mexican restaurant. We'll be good. We have to make choices and they're, they're based on our thinking. That's why if you want to change your behavior, I think the best way to do it is change your thinking. Program your mind by reading, by studying, whatever that area is. Learn the facts. That'll guide you, literally, in decisions you make. Jonathan Edwards defined the will as the mind choosing. Well, let's carry this idea of the will to the non-regenerate. Does a lost person have a free will to choose God or reject Him? By far, the majority of the church today believes that the lost person has a free will. Now, the church during the days of the Reformation held that man had no free will. In the 18th century, Campbell, who was a Scottish preacher, was excommunicated from the church for teaching that man had a free will. <laughs> we have come a long way, baby. Today, you're almost excommunicated for teaching he doesn't have one, all right? But here's the problem as I see it. The church today is man-centered. So they want man to be able to determine his own destiny. How, who does God think he is to get involved in my destiny and butt his nose in there? And that's the idea. They're man-centered. Does a lost man have a free will? No, he doesn't. He cannot choose God because he loves sin. He hates God. He has no desire for him. He cannot choose what he doesn't desire. He doesn't desire God because the heart is dead in sin. Until God changes the heart through a spiritual, sovereign act, he can't choose God. Now, Luther was committed to total depravity. The man could not choose God, as was Calvin, as was all the Reformers. As we go backward in time, we see that Augustine taught the same thing in the 5th century. Augustine said, man's will is entirely corrupted by the fall so that he must be considered totally depraved and unable to exercise his will in regard to the matter of salvation. Calvin is really just Augustinian. He just took the stuff that Augustine taught and developed that, basically. So the Reformers taught this in the 16th century. Augustine taught it in the 5th century. And the Apostles taught it in the 1st century. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Not one who does good. Now people will admit they're sinners, but not many will admit that sin is this serious. 
Is there really no one who does good? I mean, we see unbelievers doing good every day, obeying laws, providing for their families, giving to the needy. Is Paul using hyperbole here? No, he's quoting Scripture. He's not exaggerating to make a point. This is God's judgment on fallen man. What is the standard of good? What's the standard by, every, by which every man will be judged? The law of God, right? And God doesn't grade on a curve. He demands perfection. We do not do what God commands ever apart from His grace. He says there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Do you believe that? No one seeks after God? Have you ever heard anyone say they're not a Christian, but they're searching? What are they searching for? According to this verse, no one seeks for God. But we have churches today, they're called seeker-sensitive churches. So they're sensitive to those people that are seekers. And when you come in, they say, I'm sensitive that you're a seeker. So I'm going to treat you real nice. I'm going to show you a movie. I'm going to get you a cappuccino. I'm, gonna do, I'm not going to present the gospel to you. I don't want to offend you. But I'm going to be sensitive to your seeking needs. How do you build a church around a doctrine that doesn't even exist? People are not searching for God. I got news for you. God's not hiding. Okay? He's not hiding. In the Garden of Eden, who was it that hid? Was God hiding Adam and Eve? God, where are you? No, Adam and Eve hid when they heard God coming. Man is the one hiding. It's not God. Look at Luke 19.10. But the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And I want you to understand, He's not just seeking, He's saving. People don't seek God. Now, they might seek after the benefits that God can give them, but they don't seek God Himself. There is nothing good in the flesh. It can do nothing good. We cannot believe the gospel until God gives us life. The teaching of the Reformation is that regeneration precedes faith. The teaching in the church today is you believe, then you're born again because you believe. The teaching of the Reformation was you're born again, and because you're born again, now you can believe and will believe. We must have life before we can come to faith. The Scripture clearly shows that faith is the evidence, not the cause, of regeneration. Look at 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Yeshua is the Christ, the literal Greek here is has been, it's in the perfect tense, has been born of the Father. If you believe that, it's because you've been born of the Father. Weiss translates this, everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Christ out from God has been born, and as a result is his child. Law said the divine beginning is the antecedent, not the consequent of the believing. But see, the church has it totally backwards today. Yeshua stated this concept this way in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him that sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. The one who believes does so because he has eternal life. He's been given life, therefore he believes. That's the evidence. Spiritual death brings insensitivity to the things of God. It's spiritual slavery. The prisoners of which are helpless. This is the doctrine of total depravity. It doesn't mean, as, as it's often misunderstood, that man is as bad as he can possibly be. It means that he is as bad off as he can possibly be. The bottom line is this. Our hope does not lie in our own will. It's our will that got us into this problem. We chose to sin with Adam. We are all sure for condemnation unless God would somehow incline our wills in the opposite direction. We must have a Savior who is mighty enough to rescue us from ourselves. Clearly, God has to do something. We've made a choice. Our will is spoken. We are helplessly lost unless God chooses otherwise. This is the doctrine of total depravity. This is the teaching of the Reformation. And we've departed from that today. And as I said, today, this, the church is totally man-centered. It's all about you and what makes you feel good. The famous Baptist preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, wrote this. I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and Him crucified unless we preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. That's a strong statement, people. He says, it is the nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works, nor unless we preach the sovereignty of God in the dispensation of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, 
unchanging, eternal, immutable, conquering love of Jehovah. Nor do I think we can preach the gospel unless we base it upon the special and particular redemption of His elect and chosen people which Christ brought out upon the cross. I agree with him. I agree. And just like Luther said, you know, you're teaching atheism if God is not sovereign. This is the gospel. And the church today is being flooded with a new gospel. It's a humanistic, man-centered gospel that caters to your needs. Joel is doing a great job presenting that. Just come, I'll pump you up and make you feel good. We'll talk about God and we're in church and he holds the Bible up at the beginning of every service. Says, I'm going to be taught from the Bible. No, no one gets a clue that they're not really going to be. He doesn't even use that, but maybe he'll quote a verse. And they're just going along. Yes, I feel good. He's such a wonderful preacher. He's always positive. Listen, the gospel is always and essentially a proclamation of divine sovereignty and mercy and judgment. It is a summons to bow down and worship the mighty Lord on whom man depends for all good, both in nature and grace. Its center of reference is God. But the new gospel, the center of reference is man. You choose. You decide. You initiate salvation. The chief aim of the gospel was to teach men to worship God. But the concern of the new gospel seems limited to making them feel better. The gospel is this, people. God saves Sinners. That's the gospel. God, from beginning to end, does everything possible to save men, to bring them eternal life, to give them redemption to those who are separated from Him. God saves sinners. And if we understand total depravity, then we're going to understand that our salvation is a gift from God. And then God, and not man, is going to receive the glory. And that's where the glory is supposed to go. Paul, at the end of Romans, writes this to all to the only wise God, through Yeshua the Messiah, be the glory forever. The glory goes to God. Today in their humanistic church, the glory is going to man. Oh, I made a decision. I finally decided I needed to trust Christ. I thought this thing through, and I, 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 it's not about you. It's about what God did for you. Now, as I said, I think the Reformation is incredibly important, and I think you know, our history, I mean, the church here is in darkness and just in decay until Luther came along and the other reformers and brought light and brought the Scripture to man and got the Scripture in the hands of man. And it, it, it's just a, an important time period that we need to understand because we've departed from it. But let me say in closing that I believe there is a new Reformation underway right now. And this new Reformation also stands on sola scriptura. The Scripture alone. It is the preterist Reformation. This new Reformation is stating this. Everything Yeshua said would happen, happened. Exactly as and when He said it would within the lifetime of His generation. Is that radical? Is it radical to say we believe what Yeshua said He did? Was it radical for... Luther and those guys to stand up and say, we believe the Bible is the sole authority. We're saying the same thing. We believe the Bible is the sole authority. It's not, well, you're going against the creeds. I don't care about the creeds. Men wrote those creeds. I think they're beneficial. I think they're helpful, but men wrote them. The Bible is inspired. So if the Bible goes against the creed, and let me tell you the hypocrisy of these partial preterists who stand up and say, well, you're going against the creed. Every one of them goes against the creeds. The things they believe violate what the creeds teach. But that seems to be okay. Okay, we're against the creeds in certain areas, but you, you're a heretic because you're really against the creeds. Come on. Wake up, you partial preterists. The hypocrisy is, you know, it's crazy. You stand against the creeds by the very partial preterism you hold to. And you condemn us for doing that. This new Reformation also teaches... And everything, every New Testament writer expected to happen, happened exactly as and when they expected it would within their lifetime. Again, very radical teaching, right? We're just saying we believe the Bible. We're standing on the Bible. Unlike Luther's time, people today have Bibles. Everyone has a Bible. 
But we do have a kind of problem like Luther had. Our problem today is people don't read them. We have them, we just don't read them. And I think one of our callings is we have got to encourage people to get in the Word of God. It's one of the greatest things we can do in our day. Get them to read, challenge them, convict them, encourage them, help them to read the Word of God on a regular basis. And then teach them one principle of hermeneutics. It's called audience relevance. Help them to understand. That book's not written to you, okay? You're not a Corinthian. You're not a Philippian. You're not a Galatian. That book was written in the first century to specific people, and you've got to understand it in light of the audience to which it was written. Or 2,000 years later. Therefore, when you read the word soon, guess what? It's not soon to you, it's soon to them. And if you can just get them to grasp that one principle of audience relevance, just one principle, and then turn them loose with a Bible and actually let them read it, it's amazing what will happen. If we can get them to see the truth of a first century fulfillment, their eyes will be totally open to the Scriptures. But they've got to get in them. And I pray that Yahweh will help us to be facilitators of this new Reformation. We'll understand the importance, understand the work that the Lord did in the Reformation. It truly was a work of God. And, and I think preterism also has to be a work of God. Unless God opens their eyes, they won't see. But God's certainly not going to open people's eyes unless they get into the Word of God. Let's be facilitators. Let's be leaders of this new Reformation simply by encouraging people to read their Bible. And guess what? If they never come to preterism and they get in their Bible, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your Word. Lord, I thank you for the privilege, the too often ignored privilege, to have the Word of God in my language, at my fingertips, that I can read any time of day or night that I choose to, freely and openly. Thank you so much, Lord, that we have your Word. And I pray your forgiveness, Father, because we so neglect it. It seems like those people bound in the Catholic Church during the Reformation will rise up against us. Saying, how can you have the Bible and not spend time in it? Give us a heart for the Scripture, Lord. May we desire to know you in such an intimate way that we spend time with you on a regular basis. Teach us, Lord. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.